ping, and then you're ready to go. Go ahead. Thank you, Laura. Cool. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, everyone, for watching this, because we will post this in social media afterwards. So when I mentioned the chat on this recording, um, those who are live put questions in the chat. On those who are not, just comment on the video and we'll look at those. We will do an intro who we are ourselves, then what the what Clay does, and then we'll go a deeper and deeper into what it is, how we build it, why we build it. This is not really meant for a technical audience, so don't feel you need to have a lot of experience on AI um, or just special, but of course, we can answer any technical questions you might have. So for now, as we settle and start, please um, post where you are coming from and what kind of application you would um, like to see if clay could be applied or not. So with that, we can start. Laura, you want to intro yourself? Hi, I'm Laura Chen, um, and I'm the Clay's Chief of Staff. Thank you, Laura. And I'm Bruno Sanchez, one of the co-founders of Clay, and I'm really, really excited to show you what we are building. The whole point of this session is, is to get your feedback. We spend a lot of time building um thing that we feel is going to be extremely useful. But at the end of the day, it's not about building the thing. It's putting it in the hands of the people who should use it. And often those who might use it or might get the most benefit don't really have the time or skills or interest to learn exactly how these things work. So it's our job, those who do know, to make sure that this work well, that it's transparent, that it's auditable, and that they actually deliver the promise that they they say they can do. So I'm going to share my desktop, the whole desktop. Hopefully, I can switch to here. OK, so let's play with this before. What is clay and how can it be used? Let's start with some examples. There is This is a map of the world of places that we have started looking at things. I was looking before at, for example, Libya. And these are, these are all semi-real examples, or real examples of uses that we are exploring, but we need, in some cases, we do have real users or customers, and in some cases, we think it's important. This one in Libya, for example, imagine that you want to um, you wanna see, I saw, I noticed somewhere around here. Where was it? There we go. It was these strange things in the middle of the desert. And I wonder if maybe someone would be interested in these ones. Upon inspection, it seemed to he to be uh, circular agricultural plots. So I say, hey, I want to know about these guys. And I'm going to click a couple of them. I don't know, maybe six or seven of them. That's all I did. I just went to a place, saw something I was interested, and I click on a few examples. And I have here seven examples that are these ones. So with clay, I can say, find me more of this. Now, I'm telling it, find me more of this, not exactly the circular thing. So what it's going to do is figure out what is the common thing of, of, of these examples. Maybe it's the desert. Maybe it's the circular things. Maybe it's something else. And find more of those. And there we go. You have way, you have a lot of more examples of exactly the thing I want, and sometimes not. Why is this here? because the tool doesn't know if I'm interested in the circular things or in the desert itself. So I can say, no, this is not the one I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. Like we can check also. Um, review, this is not what I'm looking for. This is what I'm looking for. So you give it a few human feedback examples. And then you do it again, and there you go. And here, you notice a pattern that is very interesting, which is that the, the AI or this system realize that you're interested in these circular things and is trying to find similar things. And I suspect the reason this is here is because this is also agricultural places. They are not the same shape, but they are also agricultural places. So if I am interested in agriculture in Libya, then I already have some pointers of where in this massive desert where it's really hard to find anything, I will find some agriculture. So of course you see that there are 
there are all these others that it detected in green and it missed some of them. I don't really know why, but it doesn't matter. I can go and click on that one that it missed and I can do the same thing. So this is a human in the loop um, finding by similarity. Okay, so let's do another example. Let's say I intended to go to the US uh, because we have more resolution. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second, but let's keep in Europe for a second. Let's go, for example, to Portugal. And let's say that I'm interested in uh, beaches, but not just cliffs. I want sandy beaches. So I say, I am interested in this beach. Let's see, look sandy. This one is also sandy. And this one is also sandy. And let's go somewhere else. Let's go, I don't know, uh, here. There's another sandy beach, for example, maybe another place. I just give you some example. Oh, this is a big one. There we go. So I have these examples, and I find I want to find more of those. You notice that immediately, it it doesn't know, it doesn't hear me say that I, I want bitches. And there are um, there are ways we are telling you how to do these human levels, but I can explain in a second. And if not, please ask me on the questions. But it's it's not to see the pattern. And I say maybe he's interested in cities in the coast. No. So this one, there's a little bit of, this is not representative, this is not, oh, this one is, this one is, this one is, this one, uh, this is strange, oh, this is, look, you see, all the coast is already, all places in the coast are most identified, which is good, but there are also places in the middle of Portugal, why is that? And if you zoom in, it's because there is water under this coast too, but it's coast, it's lake coast, like this one, which is, I think is around Look like similar to this. Actually, this is <laughs> I'm good geolocating. But imagine that hey, I don't want I don't want lake ones. So I can click on that example, and then when I find similar, all the other lakes is gonna disappear because or most of them disappear. You see, you have only few examples of the thing that I'm looking for. I'm gonna scroll here and, and look at what I'm looking at, which is indeed the sandy beaches. And I say, hey, I don't want to work in here, I want to work somewhere else. So I export the data and then I can go to another tool, like for example, QGIS, which is completely unrelated to play, but I wanted to give the example of how you can then take the data that you did very quickly and you can add it. And there we go. We have now, uh, well, let's put some context in here so you can see where things are coming from. And here you have all the data that I was really quickly able to gather with clay. Not only that, I also have the information. If I click here on, oh wait, what can I move now the window? Because it's, how can you move the bar down? Is there a height thing? Height video panel, there we go. Ah, it doesn't say. Height top panel, can you help me? I have this little zoom bar in the height floating, there we go. That's it. And I want to categorize in uh, verification. Like for example, what it does is, hey, these are ones that I labeled positives. These are ones that are labeled like negative, or these are ones that the tool found. So there are different classes. You can see here the ones that are negative. You get the idea. So really quickly, basically, Clay allows you this no-code app to find things you're interested. And I mentioned the, the non-Euro, non-US, and it's because in the whole world we have Sentinel-2, which is a satellite open data from the European Space Agency that allows us to see anywhere, but with a 10 meter resolution. And if you make uh, patches or tiles, as you saw, of 224, which is what we chose for whatever reason, it's two kilometers. It's pretty big. We can also make them small in Sentinel, but it's still the same resolution. So that's why in other places you have NAEP and you have other, other sources. You can also use other sources. This is much higher resolution. So we can go into finding smaller stuff. The last example I want, I was doing yesterday and it was really cool. There is all these, um, there we go here. Uh, wind, wind turbines, and I want to find wind turbines in California. So I click on a few examples of wind turbines. 
go on. Also the smallest one, bigger ones. Just see the size of the tile. The size of the this little green square is much smaller because the data has more resolution and we can make them smaller. Have eight examples of the house. That's how they look like. And again, it's going to find similar. Similar, but similar to the images. So thing I'm looking for. So I say, this is not what I'm looking for. This is not what I'm looking for. This is so reinforce the things I want to find. And a couple of loops, same idea, I find. Basically, you can think of this as a universal finder of things in satellite images, which is extremely powerful. How does this work? What, what, what's, what's going on here? The reason I can only go to some places is because uh, I need to prepare the data. And to prepare the data, what I what I mean is that I need to convert the satellite images themselves, which could be gigabytes, into extremely small and smart vectors, embeddings. And to make those embeddings, I use a tool, which is called Build, that these apps are being constructed right now. They are not open to the public, but we, we, we are working to make them open to you as soon as possible. The only reason it is not public to the uh, not open to the public is because they are rough, still still rough. And if you use them, you're gonna get frustrated. So that's why we want to know how you would use it to make sure that it works. Um this is how you would create, like for example, let's say there was someone from um from Seattle. So let's just say it was yeah, that's the place I'm looking for. So what you do is you say a place that you're interested or a region, or okay, this is the region of Seattle, and we add it. So this is what I'm going to be working on with this, with tiles and all of this um, similarity search. So I can edit, draw polygons, remove it, upload the JSON, whatever thing I want. And then I submit, and what I mean by that is that I am going to be able to create those embeddings that I can use on the other app or download these embeddings so I can do whatever if I'm a technical person. And I can create them with the data source NAPE, which is from the Department of Agriculture, at the size of 128, which in this case would be one, one kilometer, or Sentinel-2 at the size, which is 10 meters, at the size of 64, so it's a very small tile. So this, this is how you work. At the end of the day, you are interested in a place, you create embeddings, and then you go to the other app to use the embeddings. Our, our dream, and it's not really a long-term dream, but once we are more and more comfortable with um, the embeddings, the things you create here, the goal is to create embeddings for the whole world. That would be really cool. So you don't need to do this. You maybe choose here an instrument or add your, add your own. This is not new. This is really cool, but this is not new. It is not new because there are tools like Global Forest Watch, Global Plastic Watch, or Amazon Mining Watch, which are essentially the same thing in which you go and find what is the forestation or a forestation. The thing is that these are, in our similar pre-baked semantics. I want to find plastic uh, waste dumps or illegal miners. There is a trend which is extremely interesting. One, this is doable. And not only is doable, it is easier and easier to do. Global Forest Watch in 2012 was a, a really big effort of years and, and many people involved. Plastic Watch was later and it was cheaper and faster. And also Amazon Mining Watch. And this is a trend that we are seeing huge benefits and it rides on top of several trends. One of them, of course, is the availability of data. All of these three tools use open data and there is literally petabytes of uh, data, open data, fully open data, of anywhere in the world pretty much every week for 10 meter resolution or even smaller, like for the case of the US or New Zealand or other places. These are the things we play, can do, can create embeddings or you, for any instruments, but also commercial ones. If you have access to commercial data, you can also create embeddings for that. Play can create embeddings for any instrument, visual, synthetic radar, um, infrared, all the, if, if it has a wavelength, you can do it. Satellites, planes, drones, kites, whatever you have, you can create embeddings. And 
the trend or the the revolution more than a trend the revolution here is is this the last piece which is this ai deep learning specifically transformers architecture which is the t on chat gpt that has been incredibly um, useful to to abstract learning to abstract away so that you don't need to start from scratch every single time. And this is the same architecture, by the way, that um, self-driving uses, that translation, trans, um, transcribing, like summarizing, all of that stuff is usually the same architecture, transformers, and is using this thing, this bit that I'm gonna talk about, which is called foundational models, which is that you don't need to start from scratch every single time, like you used to be. It's not about, okay, I need to build a deforestation tool, Okay, I need to download the data, do the computer vision, calculate all the stuff from the beginning, and then do the app. Now, do I want to locate mines in the Amazons? Then I need to start from scratch with whatever data I have, maybe the same, maybe different. There is a better way, a new way that basically puts you on step nine of 10. Instead of starting from step zero, you start from step nine. And those are foundational models. And the idea is that, and it's intuitive makes sense, any tool that detects anything needs an undifferentiated concept, undifferentiated capacity to detect things like greenness or roundness or blocks or stripes. All of those things are gonna be pretty much always needed. And that's the foundational model. If you, there's also a way to put labels because all of these foundational models, all these embeddings are mathematical uh, vectors, but there are ways to also put human labels. So when I was before not knowing what I was looking for or, or not being able to just say, hi, I want the coast, there are ways to do that. And I forgot to demo that. I, we can go back to the demo. I can just open a cheat window and say solar panels or coast or rivers. This is... We are starting to put those tools there. It's not really there yet, but it's not. Re it's 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 a cherry on top in that sense, which works, and we can talk about how it works. But the idea is that foundational models, on top of transforming architecture, on top of the vast, fully open data uh, that we have available, finally unlock this hopeful, hopefully, this revolution of um, of tools to detect things where you don't even need to start from step one. Now, that's the what. And the when is now too. Why? Because two years ago, maybe we didn't have those, those architecture and maybe two years from now, we will have a much more solidified ecosystem of players. We are now in the space where you can have an outsized influence to help us build it or to be leaders using them. And that's why the how is also important. Play is a non-profit and only uses open data. We know it can use commercial data. We work with partners so that commercial data can be used too, but we want to use, only use open data and only use open source because that's the only way we can guarantee that everything we do can be fully used for commercial uses or non-commercial uses, for academia or for journalists or for anything. So that's why it's so important we are and how we how we're doing this. We are completely open data, we're completely open source, we're completely open for business and for nonprofit uses. If you are technical, that's the moment to tell you that all our code is Apache licensed. Go to GitHub and take it. Our train models are also available in Hugging Face. You can go there. They're also licensed completely open. Open Rails M is the license and you can do whatever you want with it, even selling derivatives of that. There's also documentation that you can do whatever you want to do. To give you a glimpse of what that looks like, we also have in the documentation an example for non-technical, just bear with me for maybe 30 seconds. This is a end-to-end -end example of not like starting from scratch and getting the, getting the model and um, finding the data with hosted on AWS that I'm looking for in Portugal. This is the location, the time, because there was a fire. So I want before the fire and after the fire, get the data from the stack. I retrieve the images. These are the images. Sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's not. Then I download 
the model, which is in Hagen phase, we should remove this link to point to Hagen phase, and I run the model, and I have the embeddings in the code. And then I can do things with the embeddings. And one of the things I do, OK, the image is not here, of course. Let's run this. I take a little bit. While this runs, I'll go back to it and say that we've demoed how to use the model, where the embeddings come from. And you can create embeddings with the app, or you can create embeddings yourself, because everything is open data open source. But we are also interested in the ecosystem of how this happens. As I said, we are a nonprofit for public benefit. And we want people to use our model if it's useful and make derivatives, make fine tuning based on a region or based on a commercial data. Like for example, I'm really interested in the Amazon, so let's fine tune clay only for the Amazon. We can talk about what also that means. But also we we want to work and openly to say this is useful, this is great, but what does it even mean to be great? Can we make a challenge? Can we put a competition out there where we will give ten thousand dollars of compute to the winner entry to say put forward any model that you have? We're gonna put together as a community tasks that our foundational model should do. Like when I was saying finding agriculture. There are other examples of the thing the things clay can do. Like for example, clay, the same embeddings that you saw me using to find things in Libya or California can be used to estimate biomass. You give it a few examples of how to go from a image in satellite to a biomass. And then instead of using the images, you take the embeddings, which are much smaller, much more universal or as universal as the images. You give it a few labels as examples, and then you train the model, you fine tune the model to generate these, these biomass estimates. And we get more than 90% accuracy in estimating biomass, carbon biomass with our partners as C trees. Same embeddings, we can do the same exercise and get more than 90% correct land cover. Same embeddings, as I was demonstrating, you can get really high accuracy with a couple of loops to find agriculture um, anywhere. And also we are doing, as I was mentioning, a way to um, put human labels into the embeddings. So you can type a concept, get an image with that concept or having an embedding, get what are the human labels of that. And the way it works we do in the open is that we use the current implementation is that we take descriptions of the image from OpenStreetMap, then we create also embeddings from the description and we build a model that aligns the descriptions with the images. This is a bit technical, happy to explain more, but the core idea is that by aligning the embeddings of the description to the embeddings of the image, you can go from image to description, to embeddings and just much more um, natural process. I think I, I can just really quickly show you what I mean. This is one that we are doing. With Albania, when I say it's the chat window, looking for, I don't know, rivers. So what, is, what this thing is doing, oops, I think I was kicked out for whatever reason. Sorry about that. This is what I mean. It will be frustrating for you if you use it. Let's see, let's try it again. Ghost. Okay, that one doesn't work. Let's go to where I was before. Go to this was I tried yesterday, so this should work. Here, solar panels. Solar. Okay, this doesn't work. I don't know why, but you get the idea and the code works. And this is the reason we are having these demos to know how you would use it, so that we can finish all these uh, rougher edges and make it available to you. So um, back to you, Laura, to start the Q&A. Awesome, yeah. So I think there's a few questions around um, temporal uh, aspects of embedding. So like, can we see change over time? Can we see things that change quickly like ships um, in Sentinel-2 imagery? So I think maybe you could talk a little bit more about the time aspect of embeddings and also yeah. um, how that might fit into the app. I, 
I always it's always the same question is more on the technical side or I I want to understand it that is more on the technical side. So I will just do what I usually do, which is um give a really quick answer on the most technical terms and then go back to to that and a link. So this is an appendix and it's also in the documentation. Um the way the clay model works which is that diagram, and you can see the diagram in the documentation, is, is that it's aware of time. It's aware of the time of day, it's aware of the month, I think it was. Let me see if it says there. It doesn't say there, but you can see the documentation. It's aware of time, just like it's aware of location and aware of resolution. But we don't force that. We There are other models that force time more, so the way right now embedding time and this, by the way, this is the link people want to take a look. If if you want to work with time, which way, for example, I did for the Portugal example, you create embeddings in as many time steps as you want, and then you work with those time steps to do that. The model is not it's not like um, atmospheric forecast models where they aim to reconstruct a future state. This is more a time step. This I think we could be improved, of course. This is B1, but the way now you do with time is you make embeddings over time and you detect the changes. In the case of the let's see if it works, if I find if I go to model, opa, if I go to the I want to show you in the documentation, there should be a place where we well to what example I think it's this one hopefully the graph there you go so this is over time this is the um, example from portugal and you can see the fire here not only that you can also see the cloudy images there so it's a way of changes over time in that sense i don't know if it answers your questions but um that's how we deal with time right now now that is time aware but is not time predictive yet. You can make a fine tune of that. I bet if you take embeddings, if you take embeddings, that's something that we'd love to figure to test. If you take the embeddings of places, you train a fine tune to do prediction, I bet it would do a good job. Oh, also for the app, if you mean for the app, so I just run, jump into the technical side. If you mean for the app, yes. If you want change, you want to detect changes over time with no code like deforestation or erosion or others, we don't have that yet on the UI, mostly because it's really hard to create an interface to do that. But it's on, it's on our radar and we will build that. It's just that we're trying to figure out the best way to integrate the UI component when you are searching for semantics in the simplest way possible. This is the goal here for those apps that I demo is to make them extremely simple. I always put example that ChatGPT didn't win because it was technically better. I believe it won because it was extremely easy to use. And then one kind of time-related follow-up is someone asking about um, disaster management and wondering what's the possibility of identifying damaged buildings from yeah. post-disaster imagery. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that kind of application. Yeah. I'm actually going next week to talk at the Understanding Risk Conference in Japan with much about this. Yes, so because the these embeddings they are literally explicitly designed to incorporate all the semantics in the image, regardless of the wavelength. You could build really easily a classifier of um, damaged buildings. Like, for example, you can go and click on a few examples of damaged buildings and then show me more. It's going to show you maybe ones that are not destructed, so you find fine for that. Not only that, once we integrate the time dimension, or you can do it with the code, you can instruct to give examples of destruction. So not only you say places that have destruction, but places where you have embeddings before and after. Like if you have, for example, in the war 
in Ukraine, you can get images before the war and after, and then do a little bit of like a few examples, I don't know, maybe 10 or something like that would be enough of places where you can see that discussion happening and find more. And then iteratively in a couple of loops, I bet you would be able to detect those. Same thing for erosion, same thing for landslides, even last lines would probably be, you probably don't need time to mention because the, the way a landslide presents itself is probably something you could, if a human mind can identify it, chances are that this AI can. That's kind of the rule of thumb for a lot of these transformers architecture. If an expert can detect it, so can the, the model. Great, yeah, so there's a few questions in the chat and Q&A around um, just the use of the model. Can you bring your own data? How can you yeah. bring things that make the clay model better? Yeah. Um, things like that around also what happens when you make a product, is that immediately open source or is it um, proprietary? Yeah, there's two, uh, two ways to do this. One is that as a nonprofit, we make the model completely open. You can do whatever you want with it. If you take the model and do something with it, it's fully yours. At the end of the day, what we want to do essentially is to give every single startup and every single company literally a multi-million multi -million dollar model to build things on top. We raised $4 million a year ago, and we kind of spent it all making this B1. So it it's a really great, I believe, I'm biased, obviously, <laughs> But it's kind of the only option you have to have a um, instrument agnostic, which answers another question. You can use any, any, any instrument. If it's a, if it's indexed in a stack, if it's in TIFF format, it's extremely easy. You can see some examples. I'm talking on the technical side. You can see the documentation how to do that, and I can talk about why, how we figure out how to make our model. Agnostic. If you have 10 bands from Sentinel-2, go ahead. If you have one, go ahead. If you have planet data, go ahead. If you got satellogic or drone data, anything you have, you can use it, obviously, on the technical side. On the no-code app, for now, we have integrated NAPE, Sentinel, and we are aiming to integrate other open data sources because we want to keep the that side of the house, the, the, the open data completely clean, but we are already speaking with commercial partners so that we or them or both can do that. But also recognizing again that you don't even, if you are a, if you're a startup or you are from one of these companies and you, you have everything you need, you don't even need to tell us. Um, you don't even need to say to say it in the outputs. You need to put it in the menu, the patch license, you have to put the stuff there, but that's, it's pretty powerful in that sense. That's the fear of change. That's why we're a nonprofit. We're a public service. Uh, yes, you can. I can so... see a question here from Erika Rodriguez. It's the, the model is trained from 30 meters of Landsat. Uh, I didn't mention that, but you see it in the link. It's like 70 million chips uh, that we trained from 30 meters Landsat, 10 meters Sentinel 1 and Sentinel 2. So we use Sentinel 1, Sentinel 2, Sentinel 2 has 10 meters. And we also use NAPE, which is one meter for the US. And we also used LINS, which is an open data from New Zealand, which I believe goes down to five centimeters. So the model and the model architecture is a word of resolution. So if you use any of the any of the instruments we train it for, of course, it's gonna use, it's trained to do that. If you use any instrument that is on similar resolutions, yes, it should work it is without much problem. If you use models that are, I don't know, one centimeter, something like that, I don't know if it will work, but then you can fine tune it. Uh, it and if you're not that happy with how it performs, fine tune. Um, only with the data or a combination of the same training data, which we also published, and the, and the, your data. So you can fine tune with high optical imagery, yes. Um, there's a question around kind of Clay's overall roadmap. Uh, are there concerns about how OpenAI started as a nonprofit first and then quickly changed to a for-profit model as the models became more powerful? Um, what is your commercial sustainability roadmap? Yeah, it's it's a really tough question on on the sustainability on the OpenAI thing. The the answer is clear, and 
we are a non-profit, classical non-profit in that sense. I would argue that we do not have the, any good option for the governance or technology intensive nonprofits. I think nonprofit the, the laws and regulations around nonprofits were meant for different products than this kind of products. So we are also looking for help to figure out the right governance for us. We are fiscally sponsored by Radiant Earth and they have been a known player in the space. They are the ones who legally own everything we're doing and they are the ones developing that. I have history also working with nonprofits. I also have a history of working with startups. So I can see a lot of the points that this person is commenting. We do not have absolutely any plans to do that. And not only that, even if we did, the model is out there. There's no way this value is going to sink. If tomorrow we we seek to operate, and I'm not combined, to because I really hope that we continue for many many years to come. Maybe one is maybe one is open, completely open. It doesn't really matter. It does. We don't really matter for maybe one. We matter to make it usable, to make it use, which is the thing we partner more with. This part of our sustainability plans, like we did with C trees, is to figure out funders, philanthropy funders. Or non philanthropy, but they need to. I mean, if they are non profit, we can only do philanthropy in that sense. And we are committed to do that. But the answer is mm, there's no there's no plans to make up for profit inside the non profit. It's tempting. A lot of a lot of investors are calling us to say, hey, are you going to do that? And the answer is like, no. But even if we did, you should not worry because play V1. If we start making, like, this is my. Uh, test for you. If we start working on the next model and it's not built in the open, then you're going to start asking questions. Play was built in the open from day one. You can go to the GitHub. It's been public since, I think, when we started in November coding. So yeah, you can just fork the repo and take it, take it, take it home. The sustainability of the nonprofit itself, of course, depends on our funders. If we continue to find people who believe in us, in our theory of change, and continue to believe in the work we do to unblock the, the Earth semantics or Earth index, we will continue to exist. And I think the need for this kind of thing, not only the what, but the how, is only going to grow. So I'm, I feel pretty confident that we will, will be around for a while. Also, by the way, a nonprofit cannot be acquired or sold. So there's also no danger of that. It's, it's legally impossible to do. Um, and then part of a follow-up on that question is uh, just noting that we have a, an AWS um, social impact agreement and uh, does Clay currently have a cloud affinity in any sense? Um, it has a cloud affinity, which is the cloud. It, we are really thankful to AWS for believing in us in and how we do it. And actually, one of the things they told us, like, as long as you you only touch open data, it's great. Also, partly because it, it allows us to not have a lot of the legal issues that LLMs, like AIs for language, they have all these questions of who owns the output when you train with a copyrighted material. This is not the case here because we only touch open data. We do not have a certain affinity. We build in and we run in AWS because they are the ones that believed in us so far. We also um, partly build on the planetary computer, uh, partly because I love it. I helped design it. I helped start it. So I love the planetary computer. And I do know that there's people on Google uh, Earth Engine um, testing the model. You can take it anywhere. So and there's nothing. We only work with standards like stack spec, even the code itself. You can just take a look at a lot of that. Some PyTorch. And when we train it, we, well, there's, there's a lot of technical things. The short answer, happy to, to answer more of this. The short answer is that it is not locked in any cloud. We build, we proudly build on AWS because uh, they, they trust us. They, they uh, trusted us to build this thing and we are delivering not only for them, for everyone. Um, a few people are wondering about a Python API to access embeddings. Oh, we cool. They, so our current plan for version 0.2, which released in Christmas, 
we put a, a bunch of embeddings on Source Cooperative, which is another project of Gradient Earth, which is a repository of embeddings. There is also plans to also host it in AWS, the, these embeddings, and in other places. We can take it anywhere. We have not made the embeddings for V1, partly because it's 70 million embeddings, and we want your help, especially the technical among you, to test it. Say, hey, how good are the embeddings? We are getting more and more confident that the embeddings are good. So we are more, we are closer and closer. And you can go to GitHub and see the issue to create a ton of embeddings so because we understand that it makes testing play much easier. So if you have ideas of where, um, where to make embeddings, what instruments, as long as they're open data, uh, to put it in the open and where to host it. And more importantly, for the most technical view, what um, uh, standard to follow on, on creating embeddings, what formats and what uh, metadata columns and stuff like that. We are really excited about doing this. We have, with the app testing with our current partners, we've made a ton of embeddings. I don't know what the number is, but I know. Maybe we are closing to tens of millions of embeddings already. Um, Laura, with all the maidens we did for California and for Portugal and Libya and all these places. I don't know. So, yes, we are getting closer to making embeddings, and we do not have an API for using the embeddings, which is kind of your actual question. But the idea is that they will, as long as they use the standards and as long as they are hosted in a cloud environment that allows streaming, in a format that allows streaming with a stack index or something like that, it should make a, either any API that already exists around your spatial data, like stack spec, or others very easy to reuse, or maybe you don't even need them. I just wanted to make sure, to did, you also, did you also talk about the Jupyter integration and being able to- Oh yeah, forgot, so totally that. forgot. Kylie would kill me. So we're working on, um, as you saw, I use uh, JupyterLab. I just use VS Code and Cursor, um, but I I love JupyterLab Classic. And we are working to integrate the human label side into Jupyter AI. So we are working on that, will be released uh, later this year. There's one question here I see from Tanja Van Ak Heren. Sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly about um, the classifications. So, and other models train on top of the embeddings. Yes and yes. The example I did on the app right now, the no code app is for similarity search, but there are examples, if you know how to code, to use clay on regression, the biomass example. Um, um, Classification, a multi class classification, segmentation, and um, locating. How is, the, how is the name of that? Anyway, so to say not only that there is like a swimming pool, but where in the image is the swimming pool. Yeah, that's, that's all possible. In most cases, you can do that with embeddings themselves, but for Segmentation, for example, if I remember correctly, you need the encoder, you need the model. You cannot work with embeddings because it's too summarized, the image, and you need the intermediate embeddings at different layers. There's an example how to do that. It's a little bit more technical. And then once you have the embeddings, you can do whatever you want. The, I've tested using embeddings and then putting on top some forward layers. I also tested doing a random forest straight with the, with the embeddings. So there's, there's a lot of things you can do with it. The embeddings are vectors or numbers. You can do whatever you want with them. I think a good follow-up, someone asked about being able to detect different crop types without extreme training. Do you think that's going to be possible? I, I, yeah. And I, not only I think it will be possible, it will be a really critical test that that is the case. Again, this is, uh, that's, that's the thing that I find so often. We want to create the no-code app to make it as easy as possible. But at the same time, that no-code app is going to need a lot of work to cover all of these very important cases. Because at the end of the day, it's it's, there are wrappers of things you can do today. All of that stuff you can do today with the code. But you need to, you need to know how to do code. Not, 
we said you don't really need a lot of expertise. You don't need you don't need to know enough to build clay to be able to use clay. I believe if you know Python, you can use embeddings completely fine. And if you want to do adapters and things like that, maybe you need a little bit of, of help. We recommend, for example, fast.ai, which is a really good online course to get up to speed how to do fine tuning. Um, actually, the person who built Clay, Somia, the lead person who built Clay, he started with fast.ai. Um, another question around change. Is there a fixed definition of how we define change? Do you think that the model will no. be able to detect changes it's never seen? Um, and uh, yeah, just wondering about like how much sensitivity there is to um, small changes. So the clay is not a word of change. It's a word of time stops. It's a word of what time the image was taken. And probably we, we don't force that, probably uses some of that, but because it's a way of change in the sense that things change over time. So, so if the change is enough for the embedding to capture that, it's gonna it's gonna detect it. And I don't know to what degree it would be interesting to see. I believe it has really, really it has demonstrated the capacity to be as fine as detecting 90% of the biomass, which is a regression problem or the slight changes on the values of the pixels of the image or land cover classification. Uh, we did the ESA wall cover test. So I do not know how small a change it's able to, but again, test it. Don't take my word, everything's open. The way I would test it probably in, for example, you can test in time as you were saying, but also time and resolution. What is the small, smallest change the embedding can see? Like, can it see a car, for example? Um, on the road, I would say it can. And the reason I would say it can is because the way the architecture works. Part of the embedding, part of the architecture is a mask out on color, which is a way to remove parts of the image and then reconstruct it. So that takes care of any semantic that is distributed in the sense that it has a, a footprint in the image. There is not only one location. But also part of the loss, part of the thing it pays attention is a dyno in color, which is really good at the specific things that are happening in the image. So I I hope that that it's able to, but don't take my word, try it out. Um, also another question around incorporating non-remote sensed gridded data. So like socioeconomic data, weather model outputs. Yeah. Are there plans to incorporate that? Or maybe you can talk about how people can incorporate that as well on their own. Okay, before I answer that, Eugene in the chat says that how can the embedding um, do it if it's Sentinel-2 10 meters? I don't know. I was not thinking of Sentinel-2. I was thinking of NAVE or other data. Of course, you know, if, the, if the thing you're looking for is smaller than one pixel, maybe it doesn't see it. So you have to have the resolution. Again, if a human can see it, so. I believe the model can, but it's slightly better. I think even if it's only changing one pixel, think that one pixel has in eight bits to 56 uh, options for the values and it has three bands or four bands depending on the model. So even if it's like maybe like a 10% change on three bands, I don't know, maybe if there is not a lot of things changing in the chip, maybe it's able to do it. I'm hopeful, maybe I'm too hopeful, but it's also my job. And the other question uh, on using the socioeconomic data on top of that. So Clay is only able to, for now, to understand um, pixel values, remote sensing pixel values. Even things like DEMS, digital elevation models would be harder now for Clay to uh, extract the meanings from, but then you can put it on top. So you can take, uh, I don't know, poverty indices or a number of people or any, any other data on top of the embeddings and see if with a random forest or something like that, you could predict that. And I bet you could. The reason I bet you could is because there is a lot of examples of people using kind of that with images. And if they can do it with images of Sentinel-2, it only stands to reason that the embeddings, which are designed to contain the same amount of semantics without the with a much smaller uh, size, then so can the embeddings. 
five minutes uh, All left. right. We can probably do a rapid fire with some of the more technical questions, but one question around like building things on top of clay, they asked, is it a possibility that we can do drive calculations like carbon footprints of a building um, and build yeah. apps on top of clay? With with uh, technical, yes. I I want to say that because we can put it on the no-code app, I, I, I'm dreaming of a state, hopefully soon, where you can throw, just throw in the window labels like biomass of places or crop yields or whatever. And then the model would understand the locations, create embeddings if they are needed, do a fine tuning or random forest or whatever thing it is, and then run inference. Right now, that's not um, that's not possible, but um, you can do it yourself with embeddings and the documentation and the technical, uh, technical documentation. This is kind of what we did with uh, C3s. Generating embedding, so I did one, Brad Nuremberg. Generating embeddings at a scale can be tricky. Indeed, indeed, actually working at scale for training the model. During training, it was training for, if I remember correctly, 10,000 images, 10,000 chips per second, each of the GPU machines. It was working at a scale was a, definitely a bottleneck. We are working to create a system to make embeddings. Right now, when you have a very large area in the the tool that I mentioned, it just spins up more GPUs. We're trying to figure out how to make also CPUs. It really takes like orders of money to more time. It is tricky. That's also why I believe that, especially for open data, it makes no sense for every one of us to create embeddings of the same data. So let's agree or let's work on a model that we are roughly comfortable with we create embeddings or anyone creates the embeddings and then we put it out there associating them with the files so that we like we commit to make um, as many as we can of the public data so that then uh, when you need to work on um, on open data, you can download the images or you can make the embeddings which don't need to be generated every single time you use it because the data is the same, the files are the same. Uh, someone asked or commented that they love everything is open kind of attitude, but wondering if we could speak to how expensive it would be for someone to take this and run with it on their own. Is um, an open model without truly democratizing computation a lost cause? That's an interesting. I want to make sure I answer that correctly. So can you say that again? So they're asking about um, how much it would be, how much it would cost for someone to actually take it and run with it on their own. Um, and meaning it's... like from scratch, if you want to, if you, so if you want to do everything with it, you kind of need $4 million or $5 million. Obviously that's not at hand. That, and this is peanuts compared to what other big data players are spending making for GPT or, or Llama or others. If you take the code as it is right now, then you save all the building costs. I can still adapt it and fine tune it. The training itself, just the training, was also still a very large number that is not accessible to the vast majority of people. This is also why we've built always in the open, and we've all you can see that the contributions for people. Unfortunately, I guess we were not that known, so it's not that many people who committed and or in the sense of helping to put code. It's still open, so you can still put uh, and and help us make the best. Right now, there is a ticket asking people where do you want embeddings from to help help on that. This is also why we do it in the open, because if if you don't have clay and you want to do something clay is, you need all that data. But now that you have clay, everyone can benefit from starting on a on on step one with something that has already been already has baked in a lot of resources there. So you can reuse that. That's not only important for the important for the, uh, the the environmental footprint of training this model. We reuse that compute, and then you can reuse it for that. In that sense, any small NGO, any small group, if you don't have technical skills, you can just no code up and start from that. But if you have technical skills, then you can take the baked in the the, the model, train model and build build things on top. We are also um, 
on the competition, we also highlight how we can help others to do that. And we also mention that we will give $10,000 per of compute to whoever wins that open model to help anyone who, who doesn't have those kind of resources. But also if you're struggling to create a model and your bottleneck is compute, then talk to us and we are free to help you figure out how to get that compute or provide it for you. I believe today there is enough places with free compute, even with GPUs, that you could, um, there's no barrier. If you have access to internet, there's no barrier today to do, even if it's with um, SageMaker, or with Google Colab or Earth Engine or, or others, then there is there is no bottleneck in computer right now to leverage the foundational models that have spent a ton of money like we have. We can go over time a little bit. It seems to be this time there's a lot of questions. I'm loving it. Yeah, I think just a follow-up on what you were saying is like if you could give an example of fine tuning and how much that would cost, so maybe we can talk about the C trees. Oh, the fine tuning. <laughs> the fine tuning, I believe you can do it in your laptop. The fine tuning for, um, for the um, aquaculture one. Uh, remind me if I'm, or correct me if I'm wrong, Laura. In the fine tuning with it to detect the aquaculture locations, giving a few examples. Oh no, what's the, one of the, I don't know if it was the aquaculture example or the biomass example was two forward layers in 20 minutes with Mason's laptop. So you can do it locally. And if you do it in the cloud, it's probably sense. Because this is fine tuning. Now, if you want to uh, fine tune the weight of the encoder, then it's, an, it's another, it, it's much more. I don't know how much more, but it's it's more. But you don't need to. That's what working. There's things like LoRa and cool LoRa and adapters and things like that that should minimize the amount of compute you need to do. The model itself is one gigabyte, which is pretty big. The reason it's that big is because it also includes an entire dyno frame embeddings for the losses. Not we don't use them on the inference. What we use is for the training load. Technical question, but yeah, I. I would say you can do very useful fine tuning on your laptop, even if it doesn't have, but if it doesn't have a GPU, it might, and still you can do it, but you might need to wait more. Great, there's a question that's trying to kind of summarize what this is. Um, so they ask, I'm not too technical, I'm trying to understand how this works. Is it correct to say that the clay model processes satellite data to create these embeddings, which are quickly searchable to find similar items? Thank you. And thank you for making the question on me technical. When we geeks start to talk technical, in my side away, those who are not. And we need you. We need you to ask these questions, or even we need you to use the model. Because if we only build for technical people, what's that? Two million people in the world. But if we build for the rest of the world, that is useful. Yes. A good, very good way to summarize what clay is. Clay is a way to compress an image into very small um, summary, mathematical summary you can compute with, you can search. Because when you're searching on Google for sites, imagine the same thing for features. Like you can find the closest, I don't know, Starbucks, but you cannot find the closest deforestation because that's a semantic. So now with Clay, we're going to start indexing that. And once once we know how that looks like in those mathematical summaries, in those embeddings, we can enable that kind of extremely powerful semantic perf in the open, fully in the open. So you can think of clay as a as a compression algorithm in a way. It can do much more than that, but it's a way to compress compress. Um, and then kind of going back to the more technical side, um, someone asked how we can use these embeddings at different resolutions. Could you average embeddings over an area? So maybe we can talk about that a little That's bit. That's a cool one. I don't know. This is a really good question. What we are thinking now, and if I can go back to the demo, but it's getting, uh, you, um, you can do it later. So if you remember that there was this circular 
circular uh, plots. If you make an embedding bigger than the circular plot, the circularity of that plot is on the embedding. But if you make an embedding at a small size, you will only have the circularity on the edges of embeddings that touch the edges. So embeddings, the tiles in the middle will only see agriculture and the tiles outside will only see desert. So it is true that, that sometimes the semantics depend on the resolution intrinsically and you cannot average the average of um, the average of the small tiles of that circle it's not going to be a circle. It's going to be a smooth, maybe a, like a blurred version of that. I don't know how to solve that, honestly. My only, our only um, hack is to make embeddings of different sizes. So make embeddings bigger and you make embeddings smaller. You can throw them all together. I think that's totally fine. And then when you find for circularity, we'll be able to find small circles and big circles, because I believe that um, it would work across resolutions because we train it to be aware of resolution and it has, it's been trained on, on different resolutions. Okay, a couple more questions to bring us home here. Um, is there much difference or have you compared a pre-trained model for semantic segmentation on a sensor um, and then transfer learning to new sensors for you versus using a foundation model? Um, so they're asking if the foundation model just tries to fast forward you um, to the step of transfer learning to new sensors. Oh, I don't know if I understand that question. So you're saying that, or well, this person um, is saying that, why not take a segmentation model like SAM, and then I guess fine tune it for other use cases versus taking a foundational model and fine tune for segmentation. I think, big diff that, I think that's right? a question, except fine tuning on specific, like other sensors, like trying to use, apply it to use other sensors. So the other sensors part, we built play to hopefully solve in practical terms, most of that problem. Clay should be instrument agnostic. That is the case for the ones we train on. That should be the case that are similar to ours, which is the majority of the most used um, sensors. And I don't think you need to find tune for sensors. If you do, it would not be easy, I think. It's just a matter of time. It's just compute time and difficult in that sense. Um, so I didn't explain. The way it works is that the model is actually two transformers. One is the normal one that you've seen in many other models, a mask autoencoder, dyno, blah, blah, blah. But there is a pre-transformer whose job is to learn how to chop the image, regardless of the number of bands, regardless of the resolution, regardless of the size. So the job of the first transformer, which we call wave transformer, which adapts the DOFA paper, is to figure out a way to chop an instrument. So it doesn't look at the content of the image, only looks at the instruments. So that's why we feel fairly confident that the instrument can be extracted out because there's a whole transformer dedicated to doing that. All right, I think this might be might be our last one here. Um, There's asked... 24 people still <laughs> on the uh, listening. That's fantastic. You guys are troopers for sticking around. Um, so someone asked um, about drones. They said um, drones don't have a lot of drones don't have fixed space or spatial resolutions and wondering what it would cost um, for these platforms that don't have fixed resolution to um, use for fine tuning with the model. Um, can you give dollar estimates of what and who might be able to fine tune with these? Yeah. Um, would this yeah. exclude people who don't have the computational resources to fine tune? My dollar estimate is zero. <laughs> and the reason is zero is because it is true that a drone can fly at the high, but every image is going to have a height. And yes, maybe the dollar estimate is whatever it costs you to put resolution on each of the images. Once you have that, you can do that. You can, when you do inference, when you create embeddings of any image, you give it 
what the image and the resolution of the image on the bands, RGB or whatever it is. So if you have just one image at 70 centimeters and the next at 19, the next at one, the next at two, whatever it is, then you just do it. Um, I don't believe we have yet. Uh, we have the example of doing inference for Sentinel and you have the metadata file for specifying the instrument. I think we should make a, we should make a, a, a demo or notebook of taking one image from like a random instrument or a random drone and make embeddings of that. I hope I answered your question, Anonymous. Okay, we have, there's one last question. I think we'll, we'll wrap up there. Um, can you elaborate on the roadmap and um, timeline for new features? That's a good question. So the, um, the roadmap for the no code app is that as you saw, it's, it's looking good. It's looking close to finish, I hope. We are soon, maybe in the next couple of months, start working more closely with real, like not real, like with more partners to do things and see how they use that. Take some bags of the current scope. Uh, that's what I mean. Like, so the roadmap right now is what is the minimum amount of extra features we have to put so that the person using it can actually use it for the things it has. There's a lot of things in the roadmap. As I mentioned, I want to do regression there. I want to do classification. I want to do um, um, segmentation. Um, I want to do all of those those things. I would say they are, unless, and you can help us with that, unless we partner with other institutions or we get funding, specific funding for that, it will not be this until the end of this year, hopefully sooner, but it's constricted on basically funds, on, on funding for doing that. What I want to make clear is that Play had a chapter one, which was making B1. We made B1, we hope B1 is good enough. And if it's not good enough, we might train a little bit more, do some tweaks on men 1.5. I don't think that is the case. I believe now chapter two is taking that B1 and uh, using it. So how the focus of Clay now is to deploy it, to use it. Because it really doesn't matter what B1 is if no one is using it. So that's why I'm super excited to get to the hands of all of you. And those who are technical, you don't need to wait. Just please use it, but please also tell us how it's working. Tell us the things that is working so we can also inform the app uh, team on the roadmap to make what features are more interesting. Like one of the things we know is Sentinel-2 at the small chip sizes, good. So we make, what what's the smallest uh, chip size that we can get away with for Sentinel? Uh, I think the self-attention, um, uh, the self-attention size, I think was 32 or 16 pixels. So, that, that is kind of the minimum, maybe 32 or 50 pixels. Okay, so uh, Laura, I think this is amazing. We've had uh, this last weekly demo has been a blast. I don't know about you, but I enjoy the questions a lot. Me too, yeah. Thanks so much for attending for those people who are still, still with us. And I think that wraps up. Yes, thank you. Thank you and we'll post it here if you are looking at the recording then and you have questions reach out uh, comment on the video if it's on our channel we will pick it out and comment and yeah uh, reach out to us madewithclay.org that's where we are or we are kind of easy easy to find so thank you laura for hosting all of this thanks all right thanks bruno for for speaking <laughs> bye we'll talk to you all soon yeah.